Well, this week we're introducing DCC, Digital Command Control, and we've sort of mentioned that a whole bunch of times that we've, as we've been going forward, but now we want to take sort of a deeper dive into that subject and really look at it. Now, as we've been traveling around, you'll notice that a lot of these uh, people are controlling their railroads from uh, a single little handheld unit, or like in this case, from a smartphone. And you can do that with DCC. You can also run multiple trains all on one electrical circuit. You can wire all of your track together to just one circuit and then control a uh, hundred different trains, hundreds of different trains, all on the same track from a handheld <laughs> controller. These systems can also run your onboard sound for your locomotive or any other sounds that you choose to place on the train. They can turn the lights on and off on board the train and they can control things that aren't on the track. They can control switch machines and building lighting and pretty much any, any electrical circuit anywhere on your railroad can be controlled by your DCC system. DCC systems are uh, meant to work with uh, DC motors. They don't work on AC railroads. There may be an AC version of it. I've, I've never really looked into that. But the typical system uses onboard DC direct current motors. And uh, this is in spite of the fact that DCC is actually alternating current when you get right down to it. So. Basically, the way this system works is there's a constant voltage placed on the track and then within that constant voltage is a digital signal that can be read by decoders and the decoders can turn that into a DC control circuit of some kind, either run your motor, your lights, your switch machine, whatever. Now, unfortunately, we're going to have to dive into a little uh, geekology here going all the way back to the first few weeks when we were talking about what is alternating current and what is direct current and so on and so forth. So hopefully this will make sense. So essentially the current that's placed on the rails is an alternating current. So one rail is the neutral and then the other rail carries this signal right here alternating up and down, but it isn't a sine wave. It doesn't look like, uh, you know, nice rounded even waves. They're square waves, really distinct pulses. And the frequency of these pulses is quite high. And then the pulses also uh, come in different widths. So in the most basic version here, the short pulses are seen as ones and the wider pulses can be seen as zeros. So those can be encoded and decoded as a binary code, ones and zeros. Now in the picture here, there's seven of these pulses, which would be a seven bit word, which is something not really found in nature. If it were eight pulses or an eight bit system, that would give you 256 possible combinations, not nearly enough. So if we expand that to 16 of these pulses, then that gives us uh, millions of possible variations. So in theory, you could run your entire railroad by running these signals just through the tracks and then tie everything to that, your switch machines, your sound systems, your lights, everything could be run off of the current that's running through the tracks. But a much more reliable system would be to run a bus wire underneath the tracks or underneath the railroad. We talked about the advantages of having your entire railroad running from a bus in an earlier video rather than counting on the rail joiners and that sort of thing in your tracks to carry the voltage all the time. Now again to get a little bit uh, geeky the center line for this alternating current is not necessarily uh, neutral. It can be at an elevated voltage or it can be uh, neutral or it can be at a negative voltage. The center line here is free to float around and be whatever it wants to be. So it is possible to also place a direct current on the rails 
if you were to put DC on the rails, then this center line would simply be elevated by the amount of direct current. The voltage there would raise this line up or lower this line down. But most of these systems simply utilize the voltage that is here, typically about 16 volts between the pulses, and uh, use that as the one and only power source for the entire railroad. So it's kind of fun if you were to place, a, say, a passenger car that's equipped with 12 volt lights on the track with the DCC system turn on, the lights will simply come on because there is this 16 volt alternating current always on the track. And so the lights are going to see that voltage across the light and the lamp will come on. Now, because it's an alternating current, the average current here, the average voltage here is less than the 16. So what the lamp is actually seeing is much closer to the 12 volts that it wants to see, simply because you have to average the entire waveform here, which is actually off at certain times. And so all of your locomotives have to be equipped with a decoder Anything that you want to run from this system has to have some sort of a decoder to read this digital signal and pass this current on to whatever it is you're trying to operate, the DC motor, for example, in the locomotive. And every decoder has to have some sort of a digital address so that your system knows exactly what it is you're trying to operate with your handheld controller. And this is a settable thing. So you can say, well, I want this decoder to be in locomotive number 12 over here, so I will set its address as 12, and then when I go to my controller and call up 12, it will operate that locomotive, and only that locomotive. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of addresses available, so uh, you can set every switch machine, every light in every building, however you want to do that, to a different address, and then that will allow you to control that function from your handheld unit. There are two exceptions to this rule, and we already mentioned one, and that's if you have any lights in any of your uh, cars or cabooses or whatever, uh, with no uh, decoder whatsoever, those lights are gonna see this voltage and the light will simply come on because there's a voltage present on the track. Moreover, there's another function that some of these DCC systems have. If you call up address zero on your handheld unit, it will modulate this current that's on the track and send a pulsating DC to uh, the track. And therefore, if you have just any DC locomotive on the track with no uh, decoder in it whatsoever, it will see that DC voltage and start to move. And then you can control the speed of that locomotive by varying the width of those pulses, uh, thereby changing the amount of current going through the motor. Now, a lot of the DCC systems don't allow for this. It's not built in there. And uh, there's a lot of people out there saying, well, even if your system does allow for it, never use it because you can damage the motor in your DC locomotive. And that's very true. A cordless motor will burn out where a, a more primitive, just basic DC motor with an armature and magnets seems to work just fine on this kind of uh, system. And we use this with a lot of our LGB locomotives. They seem to be just fine with running at address zero and seeing this pulsating uh, current coming into the motor, which makes the motor hum, but it seems to work just fine. Your motor is at the greatest risk when the locomotive is not moving because it's sitting on the track seeing this 16 volts across its coils but because the pulse width is very narrow, there's no amperage, and so the locomotive doesn't move at all. And then as you increase the pulse width on the uh, 16 volts, amperage starts to flow through the motor, and so it starts to move. And then at the highest speed, it's seeing almost pure DC, and so then the motor's seeing exactly what it was designed to run on, and that's DC. Now, I have on occasion, accidentally left the power on on the railroad and left and gone away. 
uh, with a DC locomotive sitting on the track humming merrily away uh, at address zero. And even if uh, the controller isn't set to address zero, this voltage is always there, and so that motor is always getting these 16 volt spikes across its coils. And I've left for the night and come back the next day and gone, oops, I, I left the railroad on, and yet I've never damaged a motor because I'm just using in those locomotives the most basic DC motors, and they seem to do okay with this. Now let's quickly talk about Bachmann Spectrum locomotives because they behave uh, quite differently in this situation. If you place a Bachmann Spectrum locomotive on your DCC railroad in an attempt to run it at address zero, your Bachmann Spectrum having no decoder in it, instead of running at address zero or damaging the motor, it simply shorts out your whole railroad and the circuit breaker trips. There's a little small circuit board on the top of the motor and as near as I can tell that the whole purpose of that little circuit board is to protect the motor from DCC and uh, it does that by simply shorting the railroad out so that that voltage never finds its way to your uh, motor which I believe on Bachmann Spectrum is a coreless motor that would be damaged uh, by this uh, alternating current, this pulsating current being placed across the motor. The more modern uh, Spectrum locomotives have an easy conversion to DCC. You unplug an existing circuit board and plug in your DCC controller and just like that you've converted your locomotive to DCC. Uh, and, and therefore your motor is no longer being uh, protected by shorting out the railroad. If, however, you're converting an earlier locomotive like we did with our uh, consolidation locomotives, it requires going in there and physically removing that circuit board from the motor. Otherwise, it'll still short your railroad out even though you've put a decoder in the locomotive. Here's a link to a video on that conversion so you can look at exactly what we were up against in trying to convert these earlier uh, locomotives to DCC. Now we have spoken a little bit on the earlier videos about block systems for regular DC railroads and we're going to dive much deeper into how to design uh, the, the gaps and circuits for your block controlled system on a DC railroad. And you might say, well, with a DCC railroad, one of the advantages there is you don't need to have blocks. You can just have all of your track on all of the time. And that's true. But there are other times when you want to have the same exact block system that you would have on the earlier uh, DC railroads so that you can control things like signaling and that sort of thing. So there's still reasons to run your DCC railroad with the same kind of circuit design, track design, as you would have had on a DC railroad, complete with a, a block system like this. And that is in fact where we're headed with this series now is into block systems for DC but I wanted to uh, cover the basics on DCC so that you can see uh, the compatibility between DC and DCC when it comes to setting up blocks in your track system, which still has a lot of advantages even when you're using DCC. Anyway, I hope this, uh, this whole thing hasn't gotten too frustrating. I hope it makes sense what we're talking about here. Uh, the fundamental basics on uh, digital command control and the compatibility with uh, regular DC and that little quirk with, uh, within Bachmann Spectrum where you can't run Bachmann Spectrum locomotives on a DCC uh, railroad even at address zero because they'll simply short out. Well, if you liked this video, please hit the, uh, the like button. And if you're not a subscriber to the channel, please subscribe. Doesn't cost anything, doesn't hurt. Just uh, you can do that by clicking on the upcoming subscribe button, the blue button. Zoink right there with the blue button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Sunday because Karen and I have some fun stuff to show you. Bye-bye.